Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnadies.org. Today we are going to be continuing with our final 10 days of logic with predicate calculus, looking at proving invalidity in predicate calculus, specifically using counterexamples and finite universes. Now, we haven't said in so many words that we've been proving invalidity before, but we have methods for both propositional and categorical logic to prove invalidity. In propositional logic, we can take an argument and break it down to its basic truth tables. If we find a line in the truth table where both the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then that argument is going to be invalid. In categorical logic, we can simply take it back to the Venn diagrams that everything is kind of based on in some way and see if the conclusion appears from the premises. If it doesn't, it's going to be an invalid argument. However, we don't yet have anything that can let us prove invalidity in predicate calculus. That's what we're here to offer in this video. It's going to be the counterexample method and the finite universe method. Now, the counterexample method we've actually already seen an example of if you checked out the previous video on conditional and indirect proofs. In that video, I had the following invalid argument. All x or p implies that all x or q for all x, x being a p, implies x is a q. This is going to be invalid. We talked a little bit about why it's invalid in the previous video, but one way that you can also show that it's invalid is to provide a counterexample, as I did. In this case, I plugged in paper plane for P and quail for Q and showed that the premise can be true, but the conclusion can be false. Even though if everything is a paper plane, then everything is a quail is going to be true because the antecedent is false. The conclusion, all paper planes are quail, is going to be false. This is a counterexample to the argument. The other example I gave was there exists an x such that x is s, or there exists an x such that x is r. For all x, x being an s implies that x is an r. Therefore, for all x, x is an r. In order to see why this is invalid, you can provide a counterexample. What I did was plugged in square for s and rectangle for r, showed that we have two true premises, either a square exists or a rectangle exists. All squares are rectangles, but we had a false conclusion, which was that everything is a rectangle. This is a method that's going to be easier for simple arguments or easy if you're really innovative and you can come up with these counterexamples, but for more complex arguments or if you want a system that's always going to work and doesn't need you to be kind of more clever or coming up with these specific counterexamples, check out the next version. That's going to be the finite universe method. The way this is going to work is it's going to be based on the idea that if an argument is valid, it's going to be valid in all possible worlds. So it would be valid in a world where there is only one thing. In order to do this, we assume that only one thing exists in a world and test for truth table invalidity. If this leads to a contradiction, we assume that only two things exist in a world and test for truth table invalidity, and then we repeat adding more things to the world until invalidity is proven. You probably only want to try the finite universe method if you're pretty sure that the argument is going to be invalid, because if not, you're just going to be doing this process over and over and over again forever. Let's take a look at how this is actually going to work in terms of the symbols and the logic. So, assume that only one thing exists in a world and tests for truth table invalidity. In order to assume that only one thing exists, what we're going to do is we're going to take our universal statement all x are p, and conditionally say that it's equivalent to a is p, because a, we're just going to say, is the only thing that exists in this world. Similarly, we're going to take there exists an x such that x is p, and conditionally say that that just also means a is p, because once again, there's only one thing in this world, so there existing something that is p just means that the only thing in the world is p. It's important to note that if there's already a constant present in a premise of the argument, that that constant should be used in place of A. If there's more than one constant, you're going to want to skip to the second step already, because there's already more than one thing in the universe. 
So let's take a look at how we do this. For all x, x being a p implies that x is a q. There exists some x such that x is a q, therefore there exists an x such that x is a p. Let's test it for invalidity. First, we're going to simplify it down to a finite universe where a is the only member. We will set up our truth table to attempt to show that it's invalid by assuming the premises are true and the conclusion is false. If we don't get a contradiction here, if this is able to happen, if it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false, this is going to be an invalid argument. This is going to be a little more complicated. So we'll simplify it down to a single member of the universe. And then we'll try to fill in our invalidity truth table, but we'll see that B is an S is going to have to have two truth values. It needs to be true because it needs to be true in premise two, but it also needs to be false because it needs to be false in premise one in order to make premise one true. This is going to lead to a contradiction, so it's possibly valid and it's possibly invalid. What we'll need to do is take it to the next step and try this out for two things being in a universe. So, if this leads to a contradiction, assume that only two things exist in a world and test for truth table invalidity. In order to do this, what we're going to translate our quantified statements into is for all x, x is a p is going to be a is a p and b is a p. Basically saying that both the two things, a and b, that exist are p. There exists an x such that x is a p is going to transfer into for our universe that only has two things, A is a P or B is a P. Hopefully this is pretty intuitive. It should make sense that if there exists one thing that is a P and only A and B exist, then either A is a P or B is a P. If we are translating a more complicated statement like X is a P implies that X is a Q, we will do that in the following form. A is a P implies that A is a Q and b is a p implies b is a q. Similarly, we will do the same thing for the existential quantifier, just switching out the ampersand, the conjunction symbol, with a disjunction symbol. As before, if there's a constant already present in a premise, use that constant in place of either a or b. If there are two constants present, use both of those concepts, one of them for a and one of them for b. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So, we take our argument from before that we showed leads to a contradiction if we only assume there's one thing. However, if we assume that there are two things and we translate our arguments out, we will see taking our premises to be true and our conclusion to be false, we do not end up with a contradiction. So this is going to be an invalid argument. You then will repeat this process until invalidity is proven. Next with three objects in the universe, and then four, and so on and so forth. For three objects, you would simply add more conjunctions and conjoin the objects for the universal, and add more disjunctions or disjuncts for the existential to disjoin all of the other objects coming in. If you had to do this with a longer statement, such as x is a p implies that x is a q, once again, you're going to do the same process of just adding more conjunctions, and with the existential, you're just going to add more disjunctions. It's important to note, as with everything, if there are any constants already present in any of the premises, you have to use those constants as A, B, C, D, E, F, or whichever constants you have. You are going to have to assume there are at least as many members in the universe as there are constants in your original premises. I've been talking about that a lot. Let's take a look at some examples to really understand what that means. So if there's a constant already present in a premise, use that constant in place of A. So take a look at this argument. There exists an X such that X is T, and there exists an X such that X is U. D is T, therefore D is U. We will, to translate this, we're not going to use A, we're going to use D for our constant we will see that this is going to lead to a contradiction, so it's possibly valid. We'll then move on to there being two things in the universe. Note here we have had D and E as our two constants. When we plug this into a truth table and try to assume that the premises are true and the conclusion false, we find that it's going to work out, so this is going to be an invalid argument.
That was Proving Invalidity with Counterexamples in Finite Universes. Next up is Relations and Overlapping Quantifiers, Identity, Modal Logic, and the Final Answers to Some Logic Problems. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.